Good morning. Uh, today we are going to speak to Dr. Ntati Sinyambe. Welcome, Dr. Thank you, thanks. Uh, Dr. Can you please share with us how did you become a researcher? Um, actually, it's a quite long story, but then I will try to cut it short. In my second year, they came a lecturer who was studying in Japan. And then I believe that's how I fell in love with parasitology because it was towards the end of the year when he joined the university and then in my third year he lectured to me parasitology. Then slowly but surely I wanted to know more about the parasites. That's when he said he might be a researcher. Then I went home and checked what a researcher does and indeed it is what I wanted to do. So, in short, that's how I became a researcher in university, which is basically Thank you so much, Doctor. And then, what are you currently working on? I am a veterinarian parasitologist, meaning I work on parasites affecting animals, but particularly livestock. So, I work with farmers, I work with veterinarians, even though it has been challenging to get to the side of the veterinarians, but then the farmers, particularly the ones in in our own crop, have been very welcoming to us. So we go to the end, we ask for consent, and then we check for the, for the parasites. Um, what we usually do is to collect blood, but then I'm not a veterinary, I'm not a uh, technician, I'm not a technician. So we do have two technicians in our department that we go to the food with. They will collect blood, I will collect fecal samples, and a postdoc will collect ticks. The overall objective of this is to document the parasites we have around Kwanka and the places surrounding Kwanka. So that's what we do. Okay, Doctor, through your work, can you share with us the alphabetic resistance in livestock? Okay. Uh, or most of the rural areas, we call them places of low socioeconomic. Um, the farmers struggle a lot to get the drugs. And if they do, we find that the drugs are not enough to treat the, the animals, but then they want each and every animal at least to get treated. That results in the dosing of the animals. Therefore, because they have introduced the chemical of this drug into the body of the animal and the worm has tasted the chemical, but then it doesn't die, then the worm is going to reproduce even more, but then it will never die again from that drug. Then what usually happens nowadays is the fact that monotherapy is no longer really advised, so they use um, combination therapy. The idea behind it is to try and convert the the antagonistic resistance of, for instance, if one drug has the, the parasites have developed resistance to one drug and then they combine it with the other drug with cytogenetic effect, then that drug has better potential of keeping the, the worm than if it was on its own. I don't know if I'm making sense. You are, Doctor. <laughs> and then, in terms of training and awareness to the farmers, what role are you playing there? That is where I was hoping the genetic will come into place. Because there is a point innovation and impact. Yes. Yes. I liked that point in particular because it talks about the community and building as well as maintaining collaborations. What I believe would assist us, as for me as a researcher, I do go to the farmers and inform them that look, your, far, your, your animals are infected with this and this and this and this, then this is what you can do, recommendations. But then, since I'm not a vet, I cannot assist them with treating. But then if the university is 
get to a point whereby we establish really formal collaborations with the veterinary services as well as the farmers. We can be able to run maybe short courses as well as workshops to better teach the farmers on how to handle their, their, their animals. Thank you so much, Doctor. And then, are there any Catholic niche area in your field of study? I believe there is still much one can do. And we are always focused on resistance. There are different types of resistance, and they develop from different aspects. One, I believe that it is a potential niche that one can focus on to try and check. Usually what we do is check for proteins. If there has been any mutation to protein, hence resistance developed. It's not only by underdosing, but then also using the drug continuously for too long, then it develops into resistance. Secondly, there's diagnostic studies that one can do. This is a point where I check the process and then you want to see if the, it is still the same species it was back then or it has evolved to something else, hence the treatment is failing. Then lately is epidemiology. I think epidemiology is great to know about it better or understand it better during the COVID days because then you understand that when we speak of epidemiology, we are talking about how a parasite is transmitted, to how fast can it be transmitted, to what hosts is it transmitted to. So, yeah, I believe there is so much one can do in the veterinary parasitology field. Okay, Doctor, coming back to your work, when we take a look at the round worms, there are significant implications to health, agriculture, and environmental services, the sector itself. What uh, can you give the mitigation factors in trying to combat this round The infections? Yes. To human beings? It's doing. That is why we are advised to be worried every six months. And when you do worry, we make sure that you use. When the pharmacists say, drink it all, I know we as black people, particularly, we have this thing. If I go to the pharmacy and they give me medication and I'm struggling with the same thing, we share medication. Yes. That is a huge problem. But then to the farmers, as well. For them initially, the most important thing is that they do not know that they are what we call problems. They do know that they are animals infected, but then how to treat them is the problem. And the fact that they do not have enough resources to treat is also a problem. One farm I went to around five is actually near by my hometown. When I asked the farmer, because usually I ask the farmer how do you treat, he told me that he puts potassium permanganate into a trench where the, the animals drink. So the animals would just go drink. Firstly, he doesn't know how much of the potassium permanganate he puts in there. He doesn't know the effect of potassium permanganate to other organs of the, 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 the animal itself. So that would result in either perhaps he can feel if I can put it that way for animal sake. Yeah. And then resistance to the, the nematodes, those problems and nematodes. Yeah. But then what I would advise is, as I've mentioned, collaboration with the university. I think that will be the most important thing. When you ask the farmers why do you not treat, they will keep on saying veterinarians do not come here. So I believe the resources for the collaboration between the university, the vets, and the farmers. We can assist the vets by documenting all the parasites that are in our area. And then they would be able to go there and treat accordingly as it should be. 
and then the farmers would get the knowledge of how to diagnose if an animal is sick, how fast do you react when an animal is sick, because once the infection has spread so much, because also it spreads through the environment, the worms live inside the animals, and then the eggs are shed through feces. So it means if this, let me, let me make an example of a flock of sheep is in one place all the time, they can reinfect themselves because they are in one place. So farmers also need to learn that. Unfortunately, most of our farmers do not have enough space. But what would happen in such instances is that they would move the farm, the, the flock to another place while we did move this one. And then once it's done, it's like mutation farm. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, Doctor. And then the impact of climate change in terms of distribution and prevalence of protozoa diseases. Uh, can you share with us? Okay. I usually say to my students, they should learn the reason behind, when you read articles or when you read books, there would be a point of distribution. It's tropical and subtropical areas. So I would ask them, why do you think that is the case? And then most of them would say, because the, the, the climate conditions are conducive for the survival of protozoans, which is true. For the past few years, we've seen climate change and its effect to South Africa. There are diseases that do not occur in South Africa. Let me say not necessarily okay, but then take for instance malaria. We've had malaria in South Africa, but then it's disputed in Popo, Malanga, and North Cosmonatal because the climate is warm there. But then recently I read a paper on the possible increase of the area that can host, um, that is conducive for the breeding of the mosquitoes is increasing towards the east, towards the west of South Africa instead. And this has been due to climatic changes, meaning there are other places that used to be colder that are now warmer. And then for as long as there's warm temperature, there's humidity, and then there's some heap of rubbish, suddenly the mosquitoes will be able, and the convoluted mosquitoes will be able to breed in such areas, meaning that we are likely to see the increase of the distribution of malaria in South Africa. Thank you for highlighting us, Doctor. And then, what message can you share with aspiring researchers? Okay, <laughs> if you're going to say I'm mean, aspiring researcher myself, yes. but then if you put your mind to something, I believe you can achieve it. It has been quite challenging, especially because of the place I did my PhD in and then coming back home. But then with your, I believe if you need you have the passion for something, you can make it happen even if it's not, the environment is no longer as glamorous as I'm used to, as I'm used to, but then it is possible you get like those niches that you can tackle here while you are building your profile. So it is very important. After all, we need to start somewhere, all of us. Thank you so much, Dr. And then coming back to Vision 130. Uh, one of the tenets is about academic excellence, quality, and impact. And then you did highlight it collaboration. So, what, what do you think can be done to foster that collaboration in terms of uh, uh, building? community of practice and also emphasis on collaboration for fostering innovation. 
I believe the university is already on the right track when it comes to collaboration. It was I do get support myself to go out and work with farmers. So much that the farmers now know what the University of the Free State does. And then also I'm in the steering committee of Near Lab. Near Lab the, the, the specialized in technology. Actually it is a lab that was built for people in Kwaka to try and mitigate the challenges such as electricity in the water. And then we do get support for such um, collaborations. So I do believe that the university already is in the right track. We just need to fast forward yes, <laughs> the whole process. And at the right moment, at this moment, we are on the right track. Okay, thank you so much. And then what do you think uh, artificial intelligence can play in your field of, of study? Your artificial intelligence, man. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure. But then if I have to think on my toes, I would say if we do have a system that can alert either the university or the farmers if there is a problem or a challenge with our farmers, then that could assist both of us. Challenge in a um, alert in what way. For instance, I do my research here at the university and then let's say I have a tablet where I can put in everything there. And then this tablet, this information gets shaped to the specific farm. It's not like they are going to publish it. But then if we make it in a better way. They, if there is something urgent, I, I recognize that means an emergency. Um, that means an urgent attention by the vets. Then the vets will be able to go there. For instance, not so long ago, we collected some balls in KZP. And then when we were doing, when we were analyzing the samples, we realized that there is one parasite that is very lethal, that is dead. And then I needed to go to my phone, send the email to the lady. The lady didn't even get my email until I called her, and that was like two weeks later. That if we have a system between us and them whereby I would be able to input anything that we think is of agency and then she realizes it, I think we would have already went on the problem. But then at the moment, the problem is still going on. And we collected some in like April. So nothing has been done so far. Oh, that's a great challenge, yes. Thank you, Doctor. And then, apart from research, what are your other interests? Yeah. I work with young people. Is I was born in Berlin, so I understand the challenges that our young people are going through. Some of the challenges I went through myself, which above all I believe is the low self-esteem. Um, the reason I say that is because I never thought to myself that. One can come from a place like Papa and become something. To avoid that, the very same person I said drew me into research when I was doing my master's was like apply for a scholarship to Japan. And the first question that came to my mind was very like, no. mm -hmm. And then I asked him, why would you suggest me of all people? There are other people from better places. Why? Me particularly, it was like I believe in your abilities. I applied. We were 14 when we got there, and I was the only one from Papa. Okay, a lot of people don't know, they do know the rest of the free state, but when we say Papa campus, they're like, where on earth is that? How do you even pronounce that? So I felt 
small unfold. Because there were other people, I was the only one from the University of the Free State, then there was one from the UP, there were other from the UCT, the BOPO, and the UG as well. We were 14 in total. We went through the interviews, we went for the tests, we wrote the English test and we were expected to write a Japanese test that knew nothing about the Japanese. So I wrote my name and submitted my my script. And then the results came back. I passed the first screen. I also did not understand how I passed the first screen because Okay, there are other people that wrote Japanese tests that I didn't even attempt because I knew nothing. They, they when, when it came to a point when we left, when we were actually out of the scholarship to Japan, we were only four and I made it. So I want my story to inspire someone from the place I'm from. Same background is to tell them that. If you put your mind to something, you can do it. And also, if you get proper mentorship. Because I don't believe, had it not been for Prof. I would be where I am today. Because for me, when we joined the university, it was my second year, and my mind was all over the place. I can't even remember what I wanted to do. I don't even think I knew what I wanted to do. But then, his presence actually helped shape me. Also, I want to teach our youngsters that there's this notion, I also hate it, that I never want to study in Europe. That's what we call it. I cannot be from Kwakwa, stay in Kwakwa, then die in Kwakwa, you know? Mm -hmm. But then I believe that I got to know him, Prof. Tigisha, because I studied here. Had, it not been, had I been somewhere else, I wouldn't have met him and nobody knows how my life would have turned out. So even if the finances from home do not allow, do your best and be where you can be. Thank you so much for the research by everyone doctor and we are thankful for sharing with us and we have learned a lot. Thank you so much.